From Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, translated by Marie Boroff. This horseman hurtles in, and the hall enters, riding to the high dais, recked he no danger. Not a greeting he gave as the guests he o'erlooked, nor wasted his words, but, Where is, he said, the captain of this crowd? Keenly I wish to see that sire with sight, and to himself say my say. He swaggered all about to scan the host so gay. He halted as if in doubt who in that hall held sway. There were stairs on all sides, as the stranger spoke, for much did they marvel what it might mean that a horseman and a horse should have such a hue, grow green as the grass, and greener, it seemed, than green fused on gold, more glorious by far. All the onlookers eyed him and edged nearer, and awaited in wonder what he would do, for many sights had they seen, but such a one never. So that phantom and fairy the folk there deemed it, therefore cherry of answer was many a champion bold, and stunned at his strong words, stone still they sat, in a swooning silence in the stately hall, as all was slipped into sleep, so slackened their speech apace. Not all, I think, for dread, but some of courteous grace, let him, who was their head, be spokesman in that place. Then Arthur, before the high dais that entrance beholds, and hailed him, as behooved, for he had no fear, and said, Fellow, in faith you have found fair welcome. The head of this hostelry, Arthur, am I. Leap lightly down and linger, I pray, and the tale of your intent you shall tell us after. Nay, so help me, said the other. He that on high sits. To tarry here any time, t'was not mine errand. But as the praise of you, prince, is puffed up so high, and your court and your company are counted the best, stoutest under steel gear on steeds to ride, worthiest of their works the wide world over, and peerless to prove in passages of arms, and courtesy here is carried to its height, and so at this season I have sought you out. You may be certain by the branch that I bear in hand that I pass here in peace, and would part friends. For had I come to this court on combat bent, I have a hauberk at home, and a helm beside, a shield and a sharp spear, shining bright, and other weapons to wield, I ween well to boot. But as I willed no war, I wore no metal. But if you be so bold, as all men believe, you will graciously grant the game that I ask by right. Arthur answer gave, and said, Sir Courteous Knight, if contest here you crave, you shall not fail to fight. Nay, to fight in good faith is far from my thought. There are about on these benches but beardless children, were I here in full arms on a haughty steed, for measured against mine their might is puny. And so I call in this court for a Christmas game, for tis Yule and New Year, and many young bloods about. If any in this house such hardihood claims, be so bold in his blood, his brain so wild, as stoutly to strike one stroke for another, I shall give him as my gift this gizarm noble, this axe that is heavy enough to handle as he likes, and I shall bide the first blow, as bare as I sit. If there be one so willful my words to essay, let him leap hither lightly, lay hold of this weapon, I quit claim it forever, keep it as his own, and I shall stand him a stroke, steady on this floor. So you grant me the guerdon to give him another sans blame. In a twelve month and a day he shall have of me the same. Now be it seen straightway, who dares take up the game? If he astonished them at first, stiller were then all that household in hall, the high and the low. The stranger on his green steed stirred in the saddle, and roisterously his red eyes he rolled all about, bent his bristling brows that were bright green, wagged his beard as he watched who would arise. When the court kept its counsel, he coughed aloud, and cleared his throat coolly, the clearer to speak. "'What is this Arthur's house?' said that horseman then, "'whose fame is so fair in far realms and wide.' Where is now your arrogance and your awesome deeds? 
your valor and your victories and your vaunting words. Now are the revel and renown of the round table overwhelmed with a word of one man's speech, for all cower and quake and no cut felt. With this, he laughed so loud that the Lord grieved. The blood for sheer shame shot to his face and pride. With rage his face flushed red, and so did all beside. Then the king, as bold man bred toward the stranger, took a stride. And said, Sir, now we see you will say but folly, which whoso has sought it suits that he find. No guest here is aghast of your great words. Give to me your gizarm in God's own name, and the boon you have begged shall straight be granted. He leaps to him lightly, lays hold of his weapon. The green fellow on foot fiercely alights. Now has Arthur his axe and the haft grips, and sternly stirs it about, on striking bent. The stranger before him stood there erect, higher than any in the house by a head and more. With stern look as he stood, he stroked his beard, and with undaunted countenance drew down his coat. No more moved nor dismayed for his mighty dints than any bold man on bench had brought him a drink of wine. Gawain by Guinevere toward the king doth now incline. I beseech before all here that this melee may be mine. Would you grant me the grace, said Gawain to the king, to be gone from this bench and stand by you there, if I without discourtesy might quit this board, and if my liege lady misliked it not, I would come to your council before your court noble, for I find it not fit, as in faith it is known, when such a boon is begged before all these knights, though you be tempted thereto to take it on yourself, while so bold men about upon benches sit, that no host under heaven is hardier of will, nor better brothers in arms where battle is joined. I am the weakest, well I know, and of wit feeblest, and the loss of my life would be least of any. That I have you for uncle is my only praise. My body but for your blood is barren of worth, and for that this folly befits not a king, and tis I that have asked it. It ought to be mine, and if my claim be not comely, let all this court judge in sight. The court assays the claim, and in council all unite, to give Gawain the game, and release the king outright. Then the king called the knight to come to his side, and he rose up readily, and reached him with speed, bows low to his lord, lays hold of the weapon, and he releases it lightly, and lifts up his hand, and gives him God's blessing, and graciously prays that his heart and his hand may be hardy both. Keep, cousin, said the king, what you cut with this day, and if you rule it aright, then readily I know you shall stand the stroke it will strike after. Gawain goes to the guests with Gizarm in hand, and boldly he bides there, abashed not a whit. Then hails he Sir Gawain, the horseman in green. Recount we our contract, ere you come further. First, I ask and adjure you, how you are called, that you tell me true, so that trust it I may. In good faith, said the good knight, Gawain am I, whose buffet befalls you. Whate'er be tied after, and at this time twelve month take from you another with what weapon you will, and with no man else alive. The other nods assent. Sir Gawain, as I may thrive, I am wondrous well content that you this dint shall drive. Sir Gawain, said the green knight, by God I rejoice that your fist shall fetch this favor I seek. And you have readily rehearsed, and in right terms, each clause of my covenant with the king your lord. Say that you shall assure me, sir, upon oath, that you shall seek me yourself, wheresoever you deem my lodgings may lie, and look for such wages as you have offered me here before all this host. What is the way there? said Gawain. Where do you dwell? I never heard of your house by him that made me, nor I know you not, knight, your name nor your court. 
But tell me truly thereof, and teach me your name, and I shall fare forth to find you, so far as I may. And this I say in good certain, and swear upon oath. That is enough in New Year, you need say no more, said the knight in the green to Gawain the noble. If I tell you true, when I have taken your knock, and if you handily have hit, you shall hear straightway of my house and my home and my own name, then follow in my footsteps by faithful accord. And if I spend no speech, you shall speed the better. You can feast with your friends, nor further trace my tracks. Now hold your grim tool steady, and show us how it hacks. Gladly, sir, already, says Gawain, he strokes the axe. The green knight upon ground girds him with care, bows a bit with his head, and bears his flesh. His long lovely locks he laid over his crown. Let the naked nape for the need be shown. Gawain grips to his axe and gathers it aloft, the left foot on the floor before him he set, brought it down deftly upon the bare neck, that the shock of the sharp blow shivered the bones and cut the flesh cleanly and clove it in twain that the blade of bright steel bit into the ground. The head was hewn off and fell to the floor. Many found it at their feet as forth it rolled. The blood gushed from the body, bright on the green, yet fell not the fellow, nor faltered a whit. But stoutly he starts forth upon stiff shanks, and as all stood staring, he stretched forth his hand, laid hold of his head, and heaved it aloft. Then goes to the green steed, grasps the bridle, steps into the stirrup, bestrides his mount, and his head by the hair in his hand holds, and as steady he sits in the stately saddle as he had met with no mishap, nor missing were his head. His bulk about he hailed, that fearsome body that bled. There were many in the court that quailed before all his say was said. For the head in his hand he holds right up. Toward the first on the dais directs he the face. And it lifted up its lids and looked with wide eyes, and said as much with its mouth as now you may hear. Sir Gawain, forget not to go as agreed, and cease not to seek till me, sir, you find, as you promised in the presence of these proud knights. To the green chapel come, I charge you, to take such a dint as you have dealt. You have well deserved that your neck should have a knock on New Year's morn. The knight of the green chapel I am well known to many, wherefore you cannot fail to find me at last. Therefore come, or be counted a recreant knight. With a roisterous rush, he flings round the reins, hurtles out at the hall door, his head in his hand, that the flint fire flew from the flashing hooves. Which way he went, not one of them knew, nor whence he was come in the wide world so fair. The king and Gawain gay make a game of the green knight there, yet all who saw it say, "'Twas a wonder past compare." Though high-born Arthur at heart had wonder, he let no sign be seen, but said aloud to the comely queen with courteous speech, "'Dear dame, on this day dismay you no wit.' Such crafts are becoming at Christmas tide, laughing at interludes, light songs and mirth, amid dancing of damsels with doughty knights. Nevertheless, of my meat now let me partake, for I have met with a marvel I may not deny. He glanced at Sir Gawain, and gaily he said, Now, sir, hang up your axe. That has hewn enough. And over the high dais it was hung on the wall, that men in amazement might on it look, and tell in true terms the tale of the wonder. Then they turned toward the table, those two together, the good king and Gawain, and made great feast, with all dainties double, dishes rare, with all manner of meat and minstrelsy both. Such happiness wholly had they that day in hold. Now take care, Sir Gawain, that your courage wax not cold when you must turn again to your enterprise foretold.
The following November, Sir Gawain sets out to fulfil his promise to the Green Knight. For weeks he travels alone through the cold, threatening woods of North Wales. Then, after he prays for shelter, he comes upon a wondrous castle on Christmas Eve, where he is greeted warmly by the Lord of the castle and his lady. Sir Gawain inquires about the location of the Green Chapel, and the Lord assures him that it is nearby and promises to provide him with a guide to lead him there on New Year's Day. Before the Lord and Sir Gawain retire for the night, they agree to exchange whatever they receive during the next three days. Sir Gawain keeps his pledge for the first two days, but on the third day he does not give the Lord the magic green girdle that the lady gives him, because she promises that the girdle will protect him from any harm. The next day, Gawain sets out for the Green Chapel. His guide urges him not to proceed. But Gawain refuses to take this advice. He feels that it would be dishonorable not to fulfill his pledge. He is determined to accept his fate. However, he does wear the magic green girdle that the lady had given him. He puts his heels to his horse and picks up the path, goes in beside a grove where the ground is steep, rides down the rough slope right to the valley, and then he looked a little about him. The landscape was wild, and not a soul to be seen, nor sign of a dwelling, but high banks on either hand hemmed it about. With many a ragged rock and rough-hewn crag, the skies seemed scored by the scowling peaks. Then he halted his horse and hoved there a space, and sought on every side for a sight of the chapel, but no such place appeared, which puzzled him sore. Yet he saw some way off what seemed like a mound. A hillock high and broad, hard by the water, where the stream fell in foam down the face of the steep, and bubbled as if it boiled on its bed below. The knight urges his horse and heads for the knoll, leaps lightly to earth, loops well the rein of his steed to a stout branch, and stations him there. He strides straight to the mound and strolls all about, much wondering what it was, but no whit the wiser. It had a hole at one end. And on either side, and was covered with coarse grass in clumps all without, and hollow all within, like some old cave, or a crevice of an old crag he could not discern aright. Can this be the chapel green? Alack, said the man, here might, the devil himself be seen, saying matins at black midnight. Now by heaven, said he, it is bleak hereabouts. This prayer house is hideous, half covered with grass. Well may the grim man mantled in green hold here his orisons in hell's own style. Now I feel it is the fiend in my five wits that has tempted me to this tryst to take my life. This is a chapel of mischance. May the mischief take it, as a cursed a country church as I came upon ever. With his helm on his head, his lance in his hand, he stalks toward the steep wall of that strange house. Then he heard on the hill behind a hard rock, beyond the brook from the bank, a most barbarous din. Lord, it clattered in the cliff fit to cleave it in two, as one upon a grindstone ground a great scythe. Lord, it whirred like a mill wheel whirling about. Lord, it echoed loud and long, lamentable to hear. Then, by heaven, said the bold knight, that business up there is arranged for my arrival, or else I am much misled. Let God work, ah me! All hope of help has fled. Forfeit my life may be, but noise I do not dread. Then he listened no longer, but loudly he called, "Who has power in this place, high parley to hold? An ungreet Sir Gawain, or give him good day? If any would a word with him, let him walk forth and speak now or never to speed his affairs." Abide," said one on the bank above, over his head. "And what I promised you once shall straightway be given." Yet he stayed not his grindstone, nor stinted its noise, but worked a while at his wetting before he would rest. And then he comes around a crag from a cave in the rocks, hurtling out of hiding with a hateful weapon, a Danish axe devised for that day's deed. With a broad blade and bright, bent in a curve, 
filed to a fine edge, four feet it measured by the length of the lace that was looped round the haft. And in form as at first, the fellow all green, his lordly face and his legs, his locks and his beard, save that firm upon two feet forward he strides, sets a hand on the axe head, the haft to the earth. When he came to the cold stream and cared not to wade, he vaults over on his axe and advances amain on a broad bank of snow overbearing and brisk of mood. Little did the knight incline when face to face they stood. Said the other man, Friend mine, it seems your word holds good. God love you, Sir Gawain, said the green knight then, and well met this morning, man, at my place, and you have followed me faithfully and found me betimes, and on the business between us we both are agreed. Twelve months ago today you took what was yours, and you at this new year must yield me the same. And we have met in these mountains, remote from all eyes, there is none here to halt us or hinder our sport. Unhasp your high helm, and have here your wages. Make no more demur than I did myself when you hacked off my head with one hard blow. No, by God, said Sir Gawain, that granted me life, I shall grudge not the guerdon, grim though it prove. And you may lay on as you like, till the last of my part be paid. He proffered with good grace his bare neck to the blade, and feigned a cheerful face. He scorned to seem afraid. Then the grim man in green gathers his strength, heaves high the heavy axe to hit him the blow. With all the force in his frame he fetches it aloft, with a grimace as grim as he would grind him to bits, had the blow he bestowed been as big as he threatened, a good knight and gallant had gone to his grave. But Gawain at the great axe glanced up aside, as down it descended with death-dealing force, and his shoulders shrank a little from the sharp iron. Abruptly the brawny man breaks off the stroke, and then reproved with proud words that prince among knights. "'You are not Gawain the glorious,' the green man said that never fell back on field in the face of the foe, and now you flee for fear, and have felt no harm. Such news of that night I never heard yet. I moved not a muscle when you made to strike, nor cavilled at the cut in King Arthur's house. My head fell to my feet, yet steadfast I stood, and you, all unharmed, are wholly dismayed, wherefore the better man I, by all odds, must be said Gawain, strike once more. I shall neither flinch nor flee, but if my head falls to the floor, there is no mending me. But go on, man, in God's name, and get to the point. Deliver me my destiny, and do it out of hand. For I shall stand to the stroke and stir not an inch till your axe is hit home. On my honour, I swear it. Have at thee, then, said the other, and heaves it aloft and glares down as grimly as he had gone mad. He made a mighty feint, but marred not his hide, withdrew the axe adroitly before it did damage. Gawain gave no ground nor glanced up aside, but stood still as a stone, or else a stout stump that is held in hard earth by a hundred roots. Then merrily does he mock him, the man all in green. So now you have your nerve again! I needs must strike, uphold the high knighthood that Arthur bestowed, and keep your neck bone clear if this cut allows. Then was Gawain gripped with rage, and grimly he said, Why, thrash away, tyrant, I tire of your threats. You make such a scene, you must frighten yourself. Said the green fellow, In faith so fiercely you speak that I shall finish this affair, nor further grace allow. He stands prepared to strike, and scowls with both lip and brow. No marvel if the man mislike, who can hope no rescue now. He gathered up the grim axe and guided it well. Let the barb at the blade's end brush the bare throat. He hammered down hard, yet harmed him no whit, save a scratch on one side that severed the skin. The end of the hooked edge entered the flesh, and a little blood lightly leapt to the earth, and when the man beheld his own blood bright on the snow, he sprang a spear's length with feet spread wide. 
seized his high helm, and set it on his head, shoved before his shoulders the shield at his back, bears his trusty blade, and boldly he speaks. Not since he was a babe born of his mother was he once in this world one half so blithe. Have done with your hacking, harry me no more. I have borne as behooved one blow in this place. If you make another move, I shall meet it midway, and promptly, I promise you, pay back each blow with brand. One stroke acquits me here, so did our covenant stand in Arthur's court last year, wherefore, sir, hold your hand. He lowers the long axe and leans on it there, sets his arms on the head, the haft on the earth, and beholds the bold knight that bides there afoot, how he faces him fearless, fierce in full arms, and plies him with proud words. It pleases him well. Then once again gaily to Gawain he calls, and in a loud voice and lusty delivers these words. Bold fellow, on this field your anger forbear. No man has made demands here in manner uncouth, nor done save as duly determined at court. I owed you a hit, and you have it. Be happy therewith. The rest of my rights here I freely resign. Had I been a bit busier, a buffet perhaps, I could have dealt more directly and done you some harm. First I flourished with a faint, in frolicsome mood, and left your hide unhurt, and here I did well by the fair terms we fixed on the first night. And fully and faithfully you followed accord, gave over all your gains as a good man should. A second faint, sir, I assigned for the morning. You kissed my comely wife. Each kiss you restored. For both of these there behooved, but two feigned blows by right. True men pay what they owe, no danger then in sight. You failed at the third throw, so take my tap, sir knight. For that is my belt about you, that same braided girdle. My wife it was that wore it, I know well the tale, and the count of your kisses, and your conduct too. And the wooing of my wife, it was all my scheme. She made trial of a man most faultless by far, of all that ever walked over the wide earth. As pearls to white peas more precious and prized, so is Gawain in good faith to other gay knights. Yet you lacked, sir, a little in loyalty there. But the cause was not cunning, nor courtship either, but that you loved your own life, the less then to blame. The other stout knight, in a study, stood a long while, so gripped with grim rage that his great heart shook. All the blood of his body burned in his face as he shrank back in shame from the man's sharp speech. The first words that fell from the fair knight's lips, A cursed be a cowardly and covetous heart. In you is villainy and vice and virtue laid low. Then he grasps the green girdle and lets go the knot, Hands it over in haste, and hotly he says, Behold there my falsehood, ill hap betide it. Your cut taught me cowardice, care for my life, and coveting came after, contrary both to largesse and loyalty belonging to knights. Now I am forty and false, that fearful was ever of disloyalty and lies, bad luck to them both, and greed. I confess, knight, in this place most dire is my misdeed. Let me gain back your good grace, and thereafter I shall take heed. Then the other laughed aloud, and lightly he said, Such harm as I have had, I hold it quite healed. You are so fully confessed your failings made known, and bear the plain penance of the point of my blade. I hold you polished as a pearl, as pure and as bright as you had lived free of fault since first you were born. And I give you, sir, this girdle that is gold-hemmed and green as my garments, that, Gawain, you may be mindful of this meeting when you mingle in throng with nobles of renown, and known by this token how it chanced at the green chapel to chivalrous knights. And you shall in this new year come yet again, and we shall finish out our feast in my fair hall with cheer. <laughs>